welcome to yet another edition of e-expressions of the new indian express i have with me former vice president of india and a man of many parts uh, um, hamid ansari welcome uh, uh, sir uh, you have a new book which is uh, raised uh, a lot of controversy as usual there's nothing that you do that is without controversy here it is uh, quite a remarkable read because it doesn't just talk about uh, your uh, political and your public career, but also a lot about uh, the times that you lived through. And that is quite fascinating. And in fact, I'd like to begin with uh, your experience at Aligarh Muslim University as a student. And then later, of course, you became vice chancellor. And I thought that was a quite a lovely period that you describe in the book. Uh, shall we begin with that, sir? All right. Yes. Why not? Yeah. So uh, would you like to uh, sort of talk about uh, the days that you spent there as a student? And in fact, you wanted to be an academic and you were sort of uh, uh, told off by Irfan Habib, the great Irfan Habib to... Not, not Irfan Habib, the father of Irfan Habib. Oh, the father. Okay. Yes. He, so, was my, he was my professor. Yeah. Very fortunate that you were. So uh, he, in fact, told you off and uh, said that you should do as your father desires, right? About that, about yeah. that, in a nice way. Yeah. The old, old man was fond of me. Right. So talk a little about those days, sir, and uh, then when you went, went back as vice chancellor, because AMU, of course, is also always in the news for reasons good and bad. Uh, so talk about your experience there. No, as a student, I enjoyed being in the university. Mm. The lively uh, circle of friends, a lively circle of spokesmen, mm. uh, sports persons. Uh, in fact, uh, we organized, uh, uh, I was involved with the University Cricket Club yeah. and uh, we organized a benefit match for a legendary Indian batsman called Syed Mushtaqali. Right. And in those days, and I'm talking of uh, late 50s, uh, we raised in the university, essentially from the university community, a princely sum of 10,000 rupees and <laughs> presented him the purse. Right. But it was time of great fun, mm. uh, great intellectual activity. Mm. Uh, and otherwise also, uh, it was a very lively place. Right. And of course, then you went to, into public service. You were a civil servant and you represented India in many countries and quite in a quite a distinguished manner. Uh, and then, of course, uh, 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 various positions before you became vice president and you were vice president for 10 years. What was uh, uh, your experience uh, with prime ministers in particular? Because you had very interesting observations about uh, Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, of, I think you were chief of protocol when uh, she was uh, prime minister. That's and right. you have equally interesting observations about the current prime minister, Mr. Modi. So talk about uh, how uh, these two prime ministers were quite important in your, in your life, in your public life. No, essentially, the, it was the functional responsibility that was entrusted to me. Hmm as uh, head of the state protocol mm. in the time of Mrs. Gandhi, I saw a different aspect mm. of the work of prime ministers and Mrs. Indra Gandhi was very punctilious about procedures, mm. also very generous when things pleased her. So that is one side of it. And not so generous when things displeased her. She was quite terse. Oh she yes, yes, terse. yes. She didn't mince words. Right. Uh, but uh, it was a good time and we went through a very important international event in that period. Right. That was the seventh uh, non-aligned conference, which was organized in New Delhi at very short notice. Yeah. Normally the notice is three years. Yeah. And that particular conference was to have been held in Iraq. Yeah. But because of the Iran-Iraq war, yeah. Uh, things were not working out the way they were visualized. And the senior non-aligned leaders, amongst whom was Mrs. Indira Gandhi, consulted amongst themselves. And around October 1982, uh, they prevailed upon Mrs. Gandhi yeah. to host the conference. Right. So she accepted that as a matter of political principle and a necessity. But then the organizational bandobast, so to say, mm. uh, was a very different story. Mm. 
uh, we didn't have enough time. We didn't have uh, enough hotels, hotel space. We didn't have uh, the pool of cars which were required and all, all sorts of things. Right. And of course, there was also the very important security concern because the people expected to attend it were Fidel Castro. Exactly. There uh, was that famous near kiss <laughs> between her and Fidel Castro, which I still remember as a child. Uh, that became quite <laughs> the headline those days, right? A remarkable personality and uh, it was, but organizing her security was very difficult. Right. And I recall a conversation with the uh, senior representative of Cuban uh, security who came in advance and I explained to him that he should not be worried. We'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, we are not worried about you. We are worried about our neighbor and its capabilities. <laughs> so Castro arrived, this might sound strange, mm -hmm. in two planes. Two planes, OK. A, a Cuban plane right. and um, it was another plane. Whose, whose was it? I'm forgetting just now. But there were two planes mm. landed within a few minutes of each other. Mm. And this secret was known only to uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi mm. and the head of the uh, R&AW at that time, uh, Mr. Who was the head? Mr. R. N. Kao. Ah, Mr. Kao was the head, right, right. So the legendary. So, uh, you know, that was the kind of thing. Now his place of stay, we had earmarked mm. a particular hotel mm. for his stay, mm. but he never stayed there oh, okay. because his security had separately and independently rented a villa where arrangements were to oh. their liking and so on and so forth. But right. there were others also uh, from Libya. General Gaddafi? Not Gaddafi, but his uh, number two. Okay, he had come. La landed without uh, much notice, two mm. o'clock in the morning. There was nobody to receive him, mm. but uh, yours truly, <laughs> spending the night at the airport. Then the Iraqis arrived uh, in their own uh, gung-ho way right. uh, with a lot of uh, weapons on them. And they had to be disarmed at the airport <laughs> and so on and so forth. Right. Hafiz, Hafiz al-Assad came. Right. So there were uh, no shortage of prima donnas, right. but they were all taken care of. And they were all satisfied despite our very limited resources. Hmm. So it and, was an uh, exciting period. Right. And Mrs. Gandhi, uh, you said, was very, very particular about details. Oh, yes, she was. Yeah. She was. Uh, give us a few examples because uh, she's known to be quite, uh, she was known to be quite punctilious, as you said, about even the menu and, you know, about the table decor, about everything. Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Every menu had to be approved by her. Hmm. Was there anything that you remember which uh, was... Oh, I remember a great deal of it. Yeah. But that would require a, uh, at least a longer <laughs> chapter. And yeah. I'm sure this is not what you... But I mean, you see, the point about her was that she would worry a great deal about table plans. Right. Who was sitting where. <laughs> okay. And on one occasion, I was called in by the late Dr. Alexander, who was her principal secretary, right. and said... Um, Prime Minister is not happy with the table plan. Mm -hmm. So I said, to, well, this is how it is done as per the uh, standard procedures. Right. So he said, all right, give me alternates. Right. I said, you could change it any way you like, but let me just add one thing. This particular order of arrangements bears the signature of her father. Right. I think that's where she said. That was enough con okay. convincing. Okay, yes. leave it. Yeah. Similarly, on one occasion, I was uh, asked to carry a message mm. from her to Rashpati Bhavan mm. about a change in seating order. Yeah. I, I, was, I was very uncomfortable right. being the emissary mm -hmm. because I had some inkling about uh, the state of things there. So I took the liberty of going up to her and I said to her, where would you like to sit? Mm -hmm. And uh, she thought for a while and she said, no, you better let it be. <laughs> <laughs> so she was amenable to reason mm. and um, she could be harsh, she could be very generous. Mm. And uh, in all of 
very interesting person mm. uh, to interact with. Right. Also, uh, Mr. Modi is a very interesting person to interact with, and you've interacted with him since he was Chief Minister of Gujarat. And you yes, mentioned, yes, yes. I have mentioned several instances, including, uh, you know, you're expressing to him uh, your disquiet about his role during the riots and uh, you know, when he talked to you about the uh, uh, the things that he had done for the uh, education of Muslims, you uh, you said that he should publicize it, and he said that it did not suit him politically. That's quite a significant statement. Yes, it? you know, uh, this was within a week or so mm. of my being elected mm. in uh, 2007. Mm. And uh, there were a number of ca callers by governors, by chief ministers, uh, political personalities, and all. And he was one of the early ones. Mm. And because my previous responsibility was uh, Chairman Minorities Commission, mm. um, I said to him that uh, had I met you earlier, mm. I would have asked a question. You see, that time Gudra was very fresh in everybody's mind. Mm. So I said to him, oh, why did you do it? Mm. And his response was what I have recorded. Yeah. that uh, people look only at this and not my good work. So I said, well, tell me about it. And then he told me what he had done for poor girls uh, of a particular community. Yeah. And I said, but this is very good. Why don't you publicize it? And he looked at me, straight at me, and said, that does not suit me politically. Yeah. So we left it at that, but uh, we developed a relationship which was very cordial because as vice president, I had to visit other states and I visited Gujarat on a number of occasions. And uh, he was always very correct, very cordial. In fact, on one occasion, he asked me if I had seen the um, white sands, mm. you know, and of moonlit night. Mm. And I said, no, he said, then you have to change your plans mm. and come back to be here on a moonlit night and see what it looks like. And it was quite an amazing thing. Mm. So, I mean, our relationship was always very good. Mm. And when he became prime minister, the same continued. So except what I certain, meant... Uh, yeah, except for a few hiccups, I think, especially when he was not happy with... Uh, your uh, conduct as he felt uh, that you were not very uh, cooperative in passing uh, the bills. You see, the, I wouldn't call them hiccups mm. because there is always, there are more than one way of looking at a situation. Mm. The leader of a party, a ruling party or the op principal opposition party looks at things in one ma manner from his or her point of view. Yeah. And my point of view, as I said from the first day of my chairmanship of Rajya Sabha, that I am a referee in a hockey match. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I watch the game very closely, mm. like a referee. I'm not a player. I have a whistle, I have a rule book. As long as the game is being played, according to the rules, I have nothing to do. But fouls are committed, then I have to blow the whistle. So, I mean, our functions were different. We were looking at the same thing from different angles. Mm -hmm. So leader of a political party or leader of any political party in parliament uh, sees the functioning in terms of his or her uh, interest in proceedings. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't uh, hold a grudge for that. Mm -hmm. um, this is what is to be done. Other leaders also did that leaders of opposition. And I cited an instance where um, the late Mr. Arun Jaitley, who was leader of opposition all the time that he was in opposition and mm. I was still there. He and I had an extremely cordial relationship, mm. you know? But the prime minister was also not very happy with uh, the Rajya Sabha TV in particular. And he felt that it was- I explored, yeah. No, I explained to him the background yeah. of the TV. Yeah. The idea of a parliament TV yeah. was initiated by the late Mr. Somna Chatterjee, Speaker of Lok Sabha. Yeah. At that point, his suggestion that the two houses should combine uh, their efforts and do a joint parliamentary channel yeah. was not accepted by Rajya Sabha for whatever reasons. Yeah. 
the then opposition was not happy about the idea. Hmm. So when I became uh, chairman Rajya Sabha, hmm. and very early in my period, second or third day, uh, Mr. Somnath Chatterjee said, "This is the background, hmm. but it would be so much nicer if you we do it together. Hmm. So why don't you have another go at it?" Hmm. And I said, "Yes, I would." And I did try hmm. with all the leaders of opposition parties and uh, government party, and at after a few months i went back to him and i said i now have the agreement mm. so let's proceed mm. so we set up a committee one senior person from rajya sabha one senior person from lok sabha mm. to work out the details mm. now that committee ran into some organizational uh, difficulties mm. so there was no agreement and i reported this back to the leaders of political parties in rajya sabha and they said why can't we start our own channel mm. so we started our own channel mm. my responsibility was only at the commencement mm. of taking the decision to start the channel right and then the organizational setup i set up a committee of leaders of parties or the representatives mm. to give broad guidelines right and my only guidance given to the Uh, leadership of the Rajya Sabha channel was try to do it on the lines of the PBS, hmm. Public Broadcasting yeah. Service in uh, in America, in America, in Australia, which hmm. I had experienced firsthand. Beyond that, I never went into it. I had no editorial control, so it was a misperception hmm. that it was my channel. It certainly was not. and the prime minister accepted that explanation well, or was still I mean, happy with it let's say <laughs> uh, our view points didn't quite meet but that didn't uh, make any difference to our otherwise very cordial relationship which continues to this day uh, have you met him of late after demitting office oh yes yeah i met him at uh, official functions of the state uh, right so there is no problem Uh, but he was less than generous when it came to your farewell speech uh, he he talked about your ideology uh, in a uh, very marked fashion and i wonder what uh, you felt about that you felt certainly somewhat uncomfortable or discomforted by that i was discomforted because that is not the uh, that is not the occasion to talk about ideology mm -hmm. farewells are farewells and there Mm. proceedings are recorded right everybody said uh, what should be said on such occasions mm. but people don't observe that he made two speeches that day mm. one what got publicized yes which is the first one mm. the same evening there was another function in parliament mm. by members of parliament to say uh, goodbye to me at which he spoke he spoke very differently i've mentioned that in the book or in yes. one of one of the footnotes right and the there is a photograph there which is in the book now mm -hmm. uh, which tells its own story right so it is a misperception mm. that uh, there was uh, uh, you know some kind of uh, anger animosity no it was not so right but unfortunately that perception is the uh, perception that most people st still carry well perhaps some sections of opinion created that perception i shall not go into it i have uh, i'm very comfortable with the way it is yeah. and certainly now 3 and 1/2 years uh, after i demitted office yeah i lead a very comfortable way, life um, in retirement right and i have expressed it in the yeah. uh, last few lines of the book yeah uh but let's talk about your role as a public intellectual and uh, you in fact uh, mention uh, a very interesting quote which i really liked uh, which was uh, i think from rajni kothari where you say the challenge of the intellectual is to keep alive the flame of hope and resurgence and to continue offering ideological alternatives to the struggling segments of the mass public yes um and do you feel that this is more important than ever now Uh, in in the situation that we're in currently certainly but it's always been important mm. 
you see an alternate viewpoint, particularly in a functioning democracy. Right. It may not be quite easy that way yeah. in a non-democratic society, but ours is a democratic society and very proud of it. Hmm. And uh, that option of uh, uh, intellectual inputs into alternates hmm. is critical. Hmm. Because you say the point is this, and this is a, was always my uh, observation about the need for debate in parliament. Mm. You see, the legislative process mm. of the government, any government, is a very acute one. Mm. Proposed legislation is drafted with great care. Mm by legal and political experts on the government side. Mm. So they take all care to uh, cover possible uh, angles. Mm. But when it comes to the house, and house is a body of people with very varying experiences, mm. you know, uh, they can tear it to bits mm. or they can add. And therefore, on many occasions, if you look at the history of parliamentary legislations, uh, many amendments are made. Mm. Many amendments are suggested. Some are made, uh, suggested, but not made. Mm. And then even after you have finalized a piece of legislation, signed, sealed, and delivered, proclaimed into law, somebody goes to a court. Yeah. Okay. And challenges an angle which the Honorable Justices, whether it's High Court or Supreme Court, um, take, look at it differently. So, you know, it is never a question of finality of wisdom. Mm. You can add, but only way to discover where the lacuna might be is to let it be aired. And that is why it is not it is important for it to be discussed. And as, as I saw it, that discussion could not be confined to front benches and leaders of parties because there may be a lot of wisdom amongst the backbenchers who are, you know, in point of time, backbenchers, or there may be wisdom amongst uh, nominated members who represent different uh, uh, experiences of life. But uh, do you feel, uh, just a takeoff point from here, do you feel that that was one of the problems with the three farm bills that have been passed recently? There was not enough debate? Well, you know, as a matter of principle, I do not comment on the work of my successors. Mm. So I would rather refrain from, uh, the public knows it, Mm. what happened, what did not happen. Mm. Mr. P. D. Achare, who was a very experienced uh, Secretary General of uh, Lok Sabha some years back, mm. had written a long piece on this in, I think, the Hindu newspaper mm. some weeks back. So I would like to leave it at that. But what has happened subsequently mm -hmm. and the expression of public opinion that has emanated by not one or two or five people, but thousands of people, hmm. there's surely something to it. Hmm. Do you agree with the uh, extent of uh, dissent that has been aired in terms of also the, uh, um, you know, the flying of the flag on the red fort? No, expression of discontent, I don't have to agree or disagree. It's a fact to be observed. Right. Flying of the flag on the Red Fort was certainly uh, despicable, mm. but there is a question which has been raised in subsequent debate as to how did those people get to the Red Fort uh, and a particular point in the Red Fort, mm. uh, which is not easily accessible. Mm. So somewhere was, somebody failed. Why did was, yeah. she fail? I don't know. You think it was our Capitol Hill moment? It was almost like that. Yeah. It was almost like that, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'd also like to talk about uh, your role uh, as, as a leading uh, intellectual once said that you should be known as 
India's vice president and not a Muslim vice president. I, of course, uh, have, uh, you know, uh, I disagree with that. But you do have certain um, uh, uh, concrete suggestions about how the Muslim community and uh, the majority community can integrate better. And in fact, um, one of the things that you've talked about is a very interesting three part uh, uh, action. Uh, which I'd just like to state quickly, and then we'll go into it. One you talk about, uh, which is says the, uh, the things that can be done to overcome the inequality tra uh, trap. One you say is action by the state apparatus. Mm -hmm. Two, invigorated and invigorated interfaith dialogue. And three, you say self-correction, which is quite interesting. Yes. Yes. This is going beyond identity issues. Mm -hmm. And you talk about Gandhi's union of hearts. Mm -hmm. So, I think these are all very significant recommendations, but do you think it's possible in today's very vitiated atmosphere? Well, it is for us, hmm. public and the leaders of opinion, hmm. to de-vitiate, de-vitiate right. the atmosphere. Hmm. You see, some years back, when Modi ji made a speech in which he used the expression, sabka saath, sabka vikas. Right. And I welcomed this in a public speech. And I said, this is very good. Mm. But for that to, oper to be operationalized, you need everybody in the race to be standing at the same starting point. Mm. If somebody is right. behind, then he, she will remain behind. Yeah. So Please. what the expression which got used in Indian political debate, uh, the notorious expression, uh, appeasement, uh, reservations and all. Yeah. There's a much better expression, affirmative action. All societies accept the need for affirmative action for those who are lagging behind. And we, uh, our governments have cons consistently accepted it. Right. But the operationalization of it for one, one reason or the other takes time. Sometimes it doesn't get operated. So uh, do you feel that there uh, also needs to be an effort by the uh, Muslim community itself to uh, oh, absolutely. integrate better? I found that a very interesting point. Would you like to a develop on that? Absolutely. I, in fact, I talked about it in uh, more than one speech, public speech. Hmm. Okay, That there are issues. What are those issues? Hmm. There's a issue of feeling of insecurity. Yes. Which is something that, as you said rightly, responsibility of the state. Yeah. But then the other is uh, lagging behind in education. Hmm. Lagging behind in uh, education of uh, uh, women. Hmm. These are things that the community has to address itself. In fact, I gave a speech after I demitted office in Calicut which was focused on problems of in Muslim women. Mm. And I gave a lot of data there mm. as to how far behind they are with the rest of the Indian community. Mm. They are not sufficiently educated. They do not participate in public life. They do not leave their homes, uh, you know, like others do mm. to contribute to public uh, uh, functioning. So these are things which have to be done, but they have all to be done together. Mm. And an atmosphere has to be, it's a duty, not just on the state, but on society, that an atmosphere has to be created mm. for this to happen. Mm. Gandhiji did it, the uh, freedom movement uh, did it, you know, we saw a more recent uh, example of it a year back in Delhi. Mm. Now, the same women who were accused of uh, living uh, behind uh, high walls and uh, parda and this parda, and that, yeah. came out and uh, demonstrated and demonstrated uh, for a longish period of time, you know, peaceful demonstration. Most of them were Muslim, not all of them were Muslims, mm. but they had the constitution in one hand. Mm. See, that is the point. So the demand for participation in civic life is a very healthy development. 
right. all segments of society must participate in the demand and in the correctives. Right. So there's nothing. I mean, when I was uh, on the ramparts, so to say, yeah. in New York, fighting off the Pakistanis, yeah. there was nothing Muslim about it. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. As a representative of India in five, six countries, yeah. there's nothing Muslim about it. Yeah. I was there as a professional diplomat entrusted yeah. with certain uh, functions and certain briefs to implement. Hmm. But uh, do you feel that the Muslim leadership, uh, uh, there, there is an absence of uh, a Muslim leadership, there needs to be a more organized form of more enlightened uh, leadership? Or is it that the women of Shaheen Bagh have shown us that sometimes you don't need a leader, you know, you can just demonstrate your own effectiveness uh, uh, in public life yourself? That's precisely the point. Hmm. You see, notionally, you need a leader. Mm. But then this is the experience of history, mm. not only of India, but elsewhere also, mm. that the notional leaders can sometimes be misleaders. Mm. So public has to make its own judgment mm. whether the leader, putative leader, is undertaking his or her responsibility or not. Mm. You can't dictate to the public. Right. Do you think we're in a situation where you do see a possible union of hearts, as Gandhiji said, or is it become quite difficult now to imagine such a thing? Look, it depends which way you look at it. Yeah. I mean, across the length and breadth of India, in cities and villages of India, yeah. people of different communities do live together people of different communities interact with each other. Yes. You know, they don't, I mean, when I'm out buying uh, uh, my rations, mm. uh, do I ask a question uh, from the uh, shopkeeper? What is your faith? I don't. Yeah. When I put my child in school, mm. do I ask uh, about the faith of uh, the uh, teacher? No. So these are things which are for purposes of political or social convenience mm. can be rigged up, but they need not be. Mm. That's my point. Gandhiji's point was the same. Mm. And we lived by it for a very long period of time. Mm. It is just that a certain atmosphere has developed in the country and in society in which these artificial lines are being drawn. It's not healthy for the country because society must not be allowed to go into stages of disintegration. Mm. It has happened in other countries in the world. Mm. You see, mm. when I was a high commissioner in Australia, mm. one Sunday afternoon, I was watching a soccer match on the television. Mm. And after the match, the two sides came to fisticuffs. Mm. It was unusual. Mm. Uh, next day, I told an Australian friend, I said, all your pretensions about being a sporty people <laughs> stand uh, belied. Mm. So he took offense and he said, well, how did you come to this conclusion? And I told him what I had witnessed. Mm. So he went back, checked, mm. and came back and said to me, oh, these crazy Yugoslavs. <laughs> these were the terms he used. Yeah. So I said, what about it? What yeah. are Yugoslavs to do? He yeah. said, don't you know that we have a million strong uh, um, Yugoslav community mm. and uh, different factions uh, fight amongst themselves, mm. the Croats and the Serbs and the, the Bosnians and all. So. This is the kind of thing which can happen in societies. Mm. You know, point is, you don't allow mm. such situations to develop. Mm. That's all. My point is just this. I said this in, I think, my speech in uh, Bangalore, in, the, in National Law School. Mm. And I would like to reiterate the point. I was Indian ambassador to uh, UN in New York when uh, all those uh, very nasty wars were being fought in former Yugoslavia. Mm. 
And at one point, the commanding general of UN uh, troops mm. was an Indian officer. Mm. So, I mean, you try to do what you can. The United Nations tried what it could do. The European Union tried what it could do. But when things go out of control, they go out of control. Never allowed that situation to develop. That's all. Do you think our institutions are still strong enough to prevent that? No, I'm afraid not. Again, I said this in the um, Bangalore lecture that uh, institutions are not delivering. Mm. And I have three simple points. Mm. In our system of governance, which is democratic governance in a parliamentary system, the laws are made by parliament and the accountability is to parliament. Mm. Now, parliament has procedures for that accountability. But there was a time when the Indian parliament would meet 90, 100 days a year. Mm. Now it barely meets for 60 days. Mm. So I'm talking of pre-COVID period. Right. Now, therefore, the work that parliament should be doing is not being done. Mm. Accountability, if, for example, I mean, a bad Indian uh, practice uh, has developed, which is quite unique to India, of parliamentary disruptions. Right. Now, disruption means what? Accountability. Right. You know, if you disrupt the question hour in parliament, or if you prevent a debate from taking place by simply making noise, then you are letting the government scot free mm. from its duty of accountability. And that is not good. So that's one part of it. Mm. If Parliament is not holding the government of the executive of the day for accountability of its actions. Then the executive becomes lax. Mm. I have seen, I have experienced uh, uh, ministers of the government, uh, this government and that government feel quite comfortable when the question hour is disrupted. Mm. Welcome it perhaps. Welcome it because they don't have to uh, answer. Mm. And I know the effort as a former uh, bureaucrat also, that uh, the efforts that have to be made to answer questions, mm. they have to be correct. Mm. And there was one occasion when the late Mr. Soren Singh, a legendary foreign minister, mm. hold his, held his office officers uh, to account. And he ended up by saying, that I will forgive all sins, but not a sin committed in relation to parliamentary questions. Really? Had he got the answer wrong in something? There was something had gone wrong. I have, uh, don't remember enough. Uh, mm. uh, you know, this was addressing down to his senior most officers. Mm. So the point is accountability. Then second, uh, I've covered two. The third is judiciary. Right. Now, I'm afraid I shouldn't be saying it. And I have to be very careful what I say. We all have to be careful. Yes. Um, it's not delivering mm. as it should. If you have, uh, uh, you know, under laws, what is this expression? Uh, I'm forgetting now. Anyway, a demand that a X person should be produced. Mm. And that demand is not heard for mm. months on end. The judiciary is failing in its functions. Mm. See, mm. so uh, my point is, unless all three are functioning, mm. the public expectations are not satisfied, the public uh, demand is not satisfied, and that means that whoever uh, is the ruler of the day, you know, mm. uh, gets scot free. Now, it may change our, every five years. We have, we have an excellent electoral democracy. Mm. Electoral. Mm. You know, we are not like uh, what we recently saw in the United States uh, quibbling about uh, election results, counting of results and things like that. But we are not a functioning democracy in that sense. And there are enough people in the country who have written about it. 
So I don't have to say it and you don't have to take my word for it right. because I see what, whether it was the older generation, Rajni Kothari and others, or people now uh, are saying the same thing. You feel that the uh, 10 years of UPA rule uh, in comparison to what we have seen now, um, it's uh, almost midway through the second term of uh, the NDA two. Uh, how would you compare these? Because your uh, term was sort of, uh, it's sort of co-terminus with uh, both, overlapped with both. Overlapped with both. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had styles of functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't like to comment on it for the same reason that I told you that I was a referee. Mm -hmm. So, but there were shortcomings then, there are shortcomings now. Right. So when uh, the leading commentator said that uh, you should not be known as a Muslim M vice president, but as India's vice president, would you like to have, uh, would you like to respond to that? Was I a Muslim ambassador? Right. Huh? Was I? Right. So that's your, that's your answer to that, yeah. That's it. Mm. I was chosen for my professional competence for a certain job. Right. And that's it. Mm. Who, who chose me for what purpose, with what uh, intentions is left to the prime minister of the day. Right. In so, fact, you, you talk about it quite interestingly. You talk about getting a message from Sita Ram Yachuri that uh, that uh, they wanted you to be vice president and then you met Mr. Manmohan Singh and Sonia Gandhi who told you formally that uh, they were suggesting... I didn't meet them, they called me. They called you, of course. Yes, they, they There's they a big me. difference, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. But, so, it's all right. It didn't make any difference to me. Mm -hmm. I was not a member of the CPM. Right. Not was I ever a member of uh, the Congress party. Mm -hmm. And I had no political affiliation. My mm -hmm. affiliation as a citizen and as an officer is to the Constitution of India. That's mm -hmm. all. I would ask, um, you know, just a couple of last questions. A very interesting uh, observation that you know, uh, noted uh, in, in the book was when the Babri Masjid was, was destroyed, uh, I, uh, you say that you uh, talked to uh, the powers that be in Delhi. Uh, you were then in Iran, I think. Yes, yes. And you talked to the powers that be in Delhi. And you were told very clearly that the mosque shall be rebuilt. And that is what you were told to tell the Iranians. That's a fact. That is quite interesting. That's a fact. Because it was never rebuilt. I, fa I, faced, I faced a lot of flack. Mm in Iran on that, mm. as some of my colleagues in other countries also did. Mm. And I was told very at very responsible levels mm. that you can convey this, that it shall be rebuilt. We all know how that turned out. Well, these are things that we live and learn. So when you look at your, um, uh, you know, the, the legacy that you uh, will leave, not just as a vice president, but also as a leading public intellectual who has tried to sort of uh, sometimes be quite a lonely voice in the wilderness. And um, you've often got pilloried for it as well. I think uh, you've been the subject of quite a few controversies, including that famous one or rather notorious one about you not saluting the flag on Republic Day. Uh, maybe you'd just like to address that quickly because you have addressed very, it in the book. Very, very simply, it is a matter of record yeah. that no one has held the office of chief of protocol mm. for a longer period in modern India's history than mm. yours truly. Which is five years, right? Which is five years. Uh, just yeah, just uh, five days short of five years to be precise. Mm. And uh, so I knew what the rules were. Mm. You see, it is the saluting base. Mm. The salute is being given by whom? Mm. By the president's bodyguard. Right. The salute is being given to the president. President of India. Okay. Yeah. It's not being given to the visiting dignitary. Right. It's not being give, given to anybody else who's present on the dais that day. Right. There are no true views about it. These are standard military procedures. Right. So, I mean, the point is, the public does not know 
uh, what lay behind a particular decision. Mm. And it is our job as uh, in people in responsible positions mm. to, you know, educate them, not miseducate them. So those silly controversies which were, uh, um, you didn't go to yoga day. Yoga day. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I know. But uh, I mean, I didn't have to say it that, uh, and my yoga guru will testify to it. Oh, you do <laughs> yoga, really? I do yoga very regularly. Oh, interesting. But I didn't say that I do. Hmm. That was my private life. Hmm. And um, I wasn't invited. Hmm. And I would not be invited, hmm. just like the president of India will not be invited, hmm. where the chief guest hmm. is, is the prime minister. Hmm. You see, that is the point. Hmm. There is a state hierarchy. Hmm. In state hierarchy, the president, the vice president, and then of course the chief justice of India and the prime minister. Mm. So you go by that, that's all. Mm. Now, this is not known to the public. Right. Or it should not be known if necessary. I mean, informed sections of public know this, others do not know. But for anybody to rig up a controversy on that, the gentleman who raised it, hmm. subsequently came to see me. I shall not take his name. I know you've not mentioned his name even in the book. <laughs> no, I will not. It's not my uh, this thing to name people unnecessarily. So it's all right. It goes on. Do you sometimes feel you were singled out uh, because of your religion? I won't say that. Hmm. I was singled out for X, Y, or Z reasons. Hmm. Religion was not my requirement. Hmm. And the last question, sir, uh, for me is really, uh, um, you know, your uh, uh, comment on Kashmir and what has happened there recently with mm -hmm. the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A. Uh, you call it a show of brute majoritarianism. Um, uh, you know. Am I the only one to say that? Certainly not. Mm -hmm. So would you like to uh, uh, develop that idea further and what can be done there now? You see, Firstly, there is a constitutional process yeah. which is listed in the Constitution of India and Article uh, Article 1 or 2, I forget uh, which one it is. Uh, this is why we need Pranab Mukherjee, even now. <laughs> he was fabulous. We could remember every article, yeah. I think, of the Constitution. Yeah. So it is there that it is in the power of Parliament hmm. to create new states. Hmm. Huh? Right. Okay, or uh, change the boundaries of new states, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there listed. Yeah. And you have to observe the process. Mm. New states have been created. States have been merged. There's nothing novel about it. It has happened many a time. But a certain process has to be followed. That's one side of it. That is procedural. Mm. But beyond that is what is the impact of it? Is there public support for it? To what extent is there a public support for it? Now, everybody who functioned within the framework of Government of India knew that 370 over time had been uh, denuded of its hard content. Mm. But for the people of Kashmir, mm. Jammu and Kashmir, it had become a sentimental issue. Mm. So you have to go about it in a certain way. My understanding of it and uh, understanding of a lot, lot of people is that that process was not followed. Mm. It was a decision was steamrolled and that was not a good thing to do. Do you think there's any recourse to that now? I shall not... Uh, resort to that uh, publicly. I have my own views about it, right. but uh, they better remain uh, off public record. The enough has been said about it by a lot of people, not just in India. You see, one of the things uh, which uh, I can take uh, immodesty credit for is that it, when I was ambassador to UN, 
I led a team, mm. a government of India team of officials and ministers who were able to fight back the Pakistani onslaught. Mm. And then for the purposes of United Nations, this Kashmir issue almost vanished. Pakistanis kept trying different ways and means, but they didn't succeed, mm. you know, because the world understood what India was saying and advocating. Mm. Now, if you see what has happened in the last one year, mm. this issue seems to come back on the international agenda one way or the other. Mm. So I think it's not a wise thing to do. Mm. It could have been done differently. But for whatever reasons, which I shall not go into, it was not. Amit Ansari, thank you so much for talking to uh, the New Indian Express. And I would recommend uh, that your book be read many, uh, by many a happy accident, Recollections of a Life. It's quite an interesting read. And it not just about uh, uh, your public life, but also a lot about your growing up years. And, I found it quite fascinating with a foreword by the late Pranab Mukherjee, who I think uh, everyone misses deeply. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for talking. Thank, thank you very much. And let me say at the end that you are perhaps amongst the very few interviewers in the last few days <laughs> who has really read the book. <laughs> all, all others have read two pages. <laughs> Well, that is why I, I have done the interview because I have read it. Thank you so much. But it Thank was you. a good, very good read. Thank you.